Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Danielle Crittenden, and I am welcoming, for the first time in her official capacity as co-splainer, Megan Cox Gurdon. Welcome, Megan. Oh, thank you for having me, Danielle. Thank you for making me part of the um, the stable of splainers. <laughs> well, you're just like one of the best splainers. Well, thank you. I think actually the metaphor is wrong. We're maybe like a harem of splainers. <laughs> a harem of splainers. Yes, but that would make us seem so impossibly more sexy than we are. Oh, I think, you know. <laughs> we're, we're going from MILF to GILF. Let's just, just admit that. Um, I just want to alert our listeners that what is very exciting about this to me, in addition to having Megan on as a cosplayer, we're actually in the same room together, and we're actually only like six inches apart, which would be reckless and, and very poor modeling of correct COVID behavior, except we have been bubbling together. We have our own, what do you call it, pod, that, that instead of being alone in at home, we've decided amongst a, a, a small circle of friends to just all agree on the rules that we follow, and then we can be together. Yeah, and it, it, it's fantastic, and I wish that we had done this earlier in the process. I, you know, we we're all in our little isolated Tanks. Um, our, yeah, our, our isolation tanks. But I've had a wonderful example. Our next door neighbors have, there are two houses next door to us that um, each contain two young children and two parents. So total four children, four parents. And right at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, when everything was locking down, these families wisely chose to lock down as an ensemble. And the brilliant thing was that three out of four parents could work unimpeded every day. And one parent, it was usually one particular dad who's a super fun dad, you can always hear cries of joy and like <laughs> squirt guns and bamboo <laughs> legs being applied to young bottoms from next door in, you know, in a humorous way. But, um, but it was wonderful. So f- four children could bomb around together and, and the parents, I mean, I hope they all get along. I mean, it's such an idyllic situation that I actually hope there's secret suffering because it makes me feel <laughs> as though I got it so wrong in this respect. Well, I think we ought to be fair at the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, it was so novel and and so dangerous, and none of us really knew what to do, even with masking and taking the precautions. I mean, I remember coming out of Whole Foods or a grocery store or the pharmacy and just like washing my hands, washing my credit card, washing your eyelids, washing my eyelids. And now that we are all, I, I mean, we can be dangerously used to it and that we sort of let our guard down. If you haven't known someone who's gotten really sick, um, or died from it. I, I was reading an article about how we start underestimating the risk to us. But it's also true that we know enough an, about it now. We know enough about its transmission. We know enough about the safety precautions. And I was think that we can then begin very careful socialization, even if it's just outside. Right. Well, you're applying rules of common sense. And, right. and I think obviously some people have are, are failing to do that. And some people have taken common sense and made it insane sense, such as the allusion to the woman who Famously, I guess, just in the Washington Post wrote about uh, washing her eyelids and, you know, using, w- using Windex on her lady parts. I mean, I, don't know, I, actually, I, didn't, I didn't read the whole that article. That wasn't but... for COVID, Megan. <laughs> no, I, I confess I did not read the whole article. It was more neurosis. I use Windex there, but for a completely different reason. No, I, I mean, I think it's almost contagious if you read about people who are so neurotic, and I didn't want to be infected by her uh, extremeness. Well, but, but, yeah, sorry. but yeah, no, no. I mean, I think, you know, occasionally we've seen these articles uh, and, and scientists have spoken up about the danger of masks. And, you know, then these things are sent around as if to justify sort of a mask-free right. environment. And actually one of the dangers of masks apparently is that when we wear them, it gives us an illusion of extra safety. Right. So, right, you, you have the mask on the outside, you have common sense precautions, and then, yeah, I think you can, well, I mean, clearly right. people are doing it, whether... Right, Whether it's a good idea or not, well, we're, we're doing well, it. Well, I spoke to somebody, a uh, person came by who literally is like his first day visiting someone and we sat on the screen porch and he'd been isolating since, what, March at this point. And he was very chatty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the pent up human the animal spirit. Human animal. It's quite extraordinary. But he, we were talking, he was talking about his mother who was like 90 in Chicago and he wants to visit her, but he's going to have to drive. And she, but, you know, definitely the older generation gets a little more impatient about taking these precautions. I have noticed and like, so, and think, Oh, it's all overblown. Or it's a little overblown. And so I said, well, why doesn't your mother, you know, but you also understood a 90 year old doesn't want to be isolated from family and friends. 
And I said, well, why doesn't she do this pod thing? And he said, well, a lot of her acquaintances, including members of her family, refuse to wear masks. Yeah, it's and 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 so yeah. therefore this and and he says and I don't want to be the one to kill mom, you know, like right. And the nephews are all like, I don't want to kill grandma, yeah. but then there are these other members of the family who just will kill grandma. So well, it's, maybe they know what the will says. <laughs> Yeah, there's a thought. Oh, I'm horrible. I'm sorry. I'm, that's I'm, so dark. I'm opposed to masking. It's all overblown, <laughs> mother. Um, no, no, no. But, but it is also true. Look, it is also true that in an excess of, of care, older people are really being put in a terrible situation. Right, right. I, I mean, I think that you and I have both seen with people we love who were, who were locked away for four or five months. Um, there was a kind of cognitive knock from that. And we've spoken about yeah. this before. It, it just, um, you know, we... It, you know, uh, isolation um, in a prison setting right. drives people crazy. Right. Well, it also happens right. at home. You know, we need. I mean, we're 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 social animals. We need human contact. It's one of the arguments that I actually make in my book. Getting in a quick plug for my book, The Enchanted Hour, uh, which is about reading aloud. But there's a subsidiary argument in it, and it it speaks exactly to this, which is that if we don't have you know, we don't bounce up against other people. We don't have contact with other people. We don't get the physiological reward chemically of being with other people. We go a little nuts. It's really very depleting for us. So right. super important that somehow we, we can touch our ancient relatives, even if we are wearing masks and plastic wrap and whatever. Well, I've been often thinking through this, and this will get to our guest who we'll be bringing on momentarily, Lenore Skenazy. I, you say Skenazy. I, I say Skenazy. Skenazy. <laughs> Skenazy. Okay. I would have said Skenazy. Uh, we're both huge fans. She's president of Let Grow. She's founder of the Free Range Kids Movement. Um, she's come up with very interesting research about what has happened to children who have been coped up and, and doing class by Zoom, et cetera, and we'll let her talk about it. But I was thinking of, I do occasionally think of us through this, and one of the mercies I think we have said often to each other is, well, thank God our children aren't small anymore. Yeah. We would be ready to blow our brains out. And, um, and this was, as you said with your neighbors, all the more important to have these pods. I mean, playgrounds have been closed down, you know, and... And, and what you do and, and, and being imagined in an apartment. And I know, I know one mother who takes her four-year-old boy to, now that it's open, the Bed Bath & Beyond because he loves the elevator buttons. Oh. And he especially likes that elevator for some reason. And he just pushes the buttons to go up and down and up and down. That's great. And there's probably a lot of clean, gleaming floor space that he can pelt along and slide along. But yeah. it's a real, I mean, we would, we would have for sure done this. We would have oh. tag teamed and everything with our kids. You know, um, you, something, what we were just saying about elderly people also, I know Lenore knows, an, uh, sorry, knows a lot about, about this aspect too. It's, it's not just, you know, elderly people with their cognitive challenges who need to have human contact. Mm -hmm. But children, you know, children are, as she will tell us, fundamentally anti-fragile. But that means they need to be biffed about. They have mm -hmm. to have physical action. You know, you can't just put them on Zoom and have them flourish. They really have to have, they have to have physical activity. Ideally, they should be biffing around with other children. But yeah, it's right. So, so you, even, if, even if it's just pushing the buttons in an elevator, that's physical action, you know, right, causing and it's effect, a change, and of, and scene it's a change and, of scene. Yeah. Well, I was in a um, small, as you know, this summer I was in a small town in rural Canada and I was in town getting coffee and they hadn't had a case in, you know, since May, but everybody was still very much observant. Um, and I was standing outside this takeaway coffee window and then this young mother with a ba dandling a baby on her lap was talking to another person. And then a young man came up, embraced them both, picked up the baby, began, you know, throwing it around and, and cooing over it. Lovely. And I sort of, but I sort of, you know, it sort of, you look at it and you go, oh yeah, that's, and then you're jarred, like, oh my God, she's, she's letting that man the touch baby. the baby. <laughs> and then another friend of theirs walked up and she's, and they raised, she goes, oh, that's, you, you know, Jim, he's in our pod. <laughs> and, oh, and so okay. you realize they had created like almost like a neighborhood pod and it was, oh, it was so blessedly normal. And I was just, oh. uh, but I also went, oh, Okay, phew, phew, I don't have to call <laughs> child services. Anyway, um, okay, well, let's, um, let's bring on Lenore and hear about her 
that it's not as bad as parents think this whole (laughs) pandemic thing, at least for kids, maybe for them. Welcome to the program. It's such an honor to have you on. We've been an waiting honor. and waiting. <laughs> it is. It's yeah, you've been waiting a long time. I'm not sure how honored I am. It's been like 12 years, but okay. Well, Great you, to you be were, here. You were saying just before, you know, as we were setting up, you were saying like, you're not used to being on a friendly podcast, which I find yeah. really surprising. Oh, that's terrible. That's no, no, there, there have been plenty of friendly ones, but this one seems super friendly. Well, is it because people just can't accept that children need less supervision than they've been getting through these, this era of helicopter parenting? Um, in terms of interviews, I would say it's just usually because it's more um, exciting for listeners if there's a lot of, you know, back and forth and animosity. Um, so really, I think it's almost like, uh, you know, the, the clickbait headlines. It's like, Lenore, you're America's worst mom. What do you got to say for yourself? And that, you know, that's like, oh, I'm going to listen to that. So. Okay, well, we'll, we'll I'll work on some animosity. <laughs> yes, and, really. And we, yeah. will, we will get you to tell us that story because I love that story. But first, I think just before Megan and I were discussing, you know, just how tough, obviously, COVID has been, especially on parents with small children and kids who are now having to Zoom class, mm-hmm. um, the whole nightmare. And you come out with this wonderful um, study, your group, uh, show, showing maybe it's not so bad. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, the group is our nonprofit, Let Grow, and our goal is to um, sort of reintroduce independence into kids' lives, something that has been slowly leached out over the last generation or two. And so what we'd always been promoting is the idea that kids need more unstructured, unsupervised time. It's when they figure out who they are, what they love to do. It's when they solve problems, when we're not there solving them for them. And so weirdly, COVID was like this strange, um, you know, gigantic experiment in what happens when suddenly classes are disappearing and after school activities are disappearing and suddenly kids who have been structured from the, you know, the second they get up in the morning till the time they get to uh, out of school and off to soccer and back home and onto the reading log and do their homework and, you know, rinse and repeat, suddenly have like just a ton of free time. And we were interested to see if like, you know, what do you do when you have this empty field? What starts um, growing there? And what we saw was that kids were bored. Our study that we did of 1600 children across America, across um, eight, not across ages, eight to 13, but across geographic, economic, the whole spectrum. Um, We did 800 kids one time, and then we did 800 kids about a month later. And we did the same with parents. And the interesting thing, um, when we gave them a, the, the kids a list of uh, adjectives, you know, uh, happy, sad, bored, scared, unhappy, I can't remember all of them, but there were, <laughs> there were 10 of them, five good, five bad, uh, and the top one that kids checked off was bored, which shouldn't surprise anybody because they don't have their activities already planned out for them um, to, the, to the second. But interestingly, the second uh, adjective they, they checked off the most was happy. And they checked that off like two or three times more than they checked off sad, which was at the very bottom of this list that we kept sending out in random order. So it wasn't like they were just always um, presented with the exact same order. And it occurred to me, I was talking to one lady who said, well, they're bored. How could they be happy? And I was like, I think those two go together because I think kids were so bored and so confused. What do I do with all this empty time that they we're uncomfortable. And when you're uncomfortable and and don't know what to do with yourself, you find something to do. And you either start Googling or you go outside and you start looking at things or you start doodling or painting. Or one guy told us that he started um, taking guitar lessons from YouTube. And he said, and the funny thing is, I actually already had two guitars that I never played. But he said, but now I had all this free time. And so for us, it's not that any parent should feel terrible that their kid isn't learning Mandarin on their own because they're, oh my God, or they're solving a physics problem. Doesn't, you know, I, I don't want to add to that um, anguish of comparison, which is just terrible. Um, but, but we found that kids were far quirkier 
uh, than I think they knew or their parents knew. And in terms of parental observations of their kids, when we asked parents this same list of, you know, how do you feel when you look at your kid? Um, the number one thing was, uh, I think it was impressed or um, grateful because parents were almost seeing the same thing that their kids were seeing, which is this flowering of a person that you wouldn't have even known was in there because there was no chance for it to do anything other than get in the car, go to school, go to after school projects and, or, you know, programs and come home. So kids are learning. They might not be learning the stuff that they would learn at school, but they're learning all sorts of things, including what turns them on. And curiosity is a really good, it's like rocket fuel for education. So in that sense, I would say that these months have been um, weirdly, uh, what's a nutritive, that's a horrible word, <laughs> weirdly regenerative for kids. Well, I, I, I think, I mean, I see this I mean, anecdotally, of course, in my own home, I see this. I, my youngest daughter is 14. And mm -hmm. I think not just that there's this kind of, um, there's there's a little bit of peace and space in order yeah. to kind of poke around and see what's, what's interesting. Mm -hmm. But there isn't always that continual comparison with other children, the continual, I mean, of course, this is a loss, right? The, the loss of uh, a social life, uh, the loss of any kind of, you know, frequent contact with other children but mm -hmm. the but the bright side of that loss is that they're not they don't need to compare themselves and how they're spending time to those around them and i think that has accounted for some of the flourishing i, I mean i've i've seen this particular daughter um who was it it was something of an introvert and therefore mm -hmm. less inclined to suffer under these circumstances. yeah exactly yeah, really like yay yeah. <laughs> but, but but um but there's m you know, the, the, the previous way of living was a kind of hummingbird way of living, high speed, even for the introvert, constantly having to shift scene and adapt and, and, and very stimulating. And in the absence of that, I, what I've seen happen with her is hours will suddenly disappear. She'll just, she'll maybe listen to music and then paint and draw, but not, you know, not for 10 minutes and not in between two activities, but just as a pursuit, because just in that, that wonderful feeling of flow, you know, that that, that creative state that we all would love to be in, especially if we're working on something, some piece mm -hmm. of writing, which is so seldom, but it happens. <laughs> now, now but when you get it, terrible. it's just like, <laughs> right. No, it's, it's agony. But when, right. you, when, you, when you experience that flow, it's one of the most kind of enjoyable feelings that there is. And I think we're seeing this on a mass scale with kids. I totally agree. Um, so there's a couple of things that you're reminding me of. One is my favorite story from a mom that I interviewed about, you know, what is happening with all this free time. And and she said that, um, like you were saying about this hummingbird sort of existence beforehand, uh, her daughter's seven years old, which means she's a first grader. And she said, up until COVID, the mornings went like this. Okay, Sydney, it's time to get up. Sydney, you're still not up. Oh my God, Sydney, come on, get up. Oh my God, you're not dressed yet. I'll get you drink. Here's your clothes. I'm going to go downstairs. And she pours out the cereal and she pours in the milk and Sydney comes down and like a robot, you know, shoves it into her mouth. And meanwhile, the mom is making the snack and the sandwich and putting it in the, and the homework and all, everything's going into the backpack and it's being shoved onto the kid's shoulders. And then in the kid goes to the car and off they go to school because if they leave at 7.03 instead of 7.01, they'll be at the back of the line and everything will be going to hell. And so... That was, that was a normal day. And, and it basically was the mom doing everything and the kid being this reluctant, I really can't blame her, but sort of a, a you know, a, a reluctant dog that was being pulled along, you know, <laughs> by the leash that was mom. And, you know, okay, it's, it's time for you to, you know, to leave the house. So then COVID, school closes. And the mom started sleeping in because she didn't have to get her kid to school at that exact time. And she didn't have to be at work at a particular time. And so then, actually, that was mom that wasn't working. So it was just a question of getting to the school on time. Um, but what happened is that Sydney, and I don't actually know her name, I'm just calling her Sydney, but Sydney was started waking up before her mother. And lo and behold, she'd go downstairs and she would get out her own cereal and her own milk and pour it in and uh, somehow manage to eat without somebody putting a spoon in her hand. And maybe she was watching a video, maybe she was reading, I don't know what she was doing, but she was obviously competent. And then afterwards, the mom said that sometimes, not every time, but sometimes, Sydney would then um, get out a banana and a little yogurt and go to the toaster and toast her mom's toast and butter it for her. Aww. And and, and what I loved about that is um, not just the, you know, the, the darlingness of preparing something for your mom, but the fact that until, if COVID never happened, her mom would have never seen that. 
And the daughter wouldn't have ever known that she was even capable of that. She would have been the, you know, the, the dog as opposed to the, the dog walker. I mean, she suddenly had this capacity for, um, for caring and competence and getting things done and making something happen in the world that she hadn't had before. And what I love about that is that I feel like that was inside her, but it's like kids are like these seeds and seeds need water to grow before you see who they and are. Air and, they and space. Water, and space. air, and space. Yeah. And, and what, they, what COVID has provided is free time. And free time is to childhood what water, air, and space are to plants. It's just, it's the, it's the I'm, I don't know why I keep using the word nutrient all of a sudden. It's like <laughs> on heavy rotation in my brain. But it is, it is what they need to flourish. And they had been parched before that because there was no free time. And so while it looks to parents like, oh my God, great. So instead of learning, you know, how to spell or long division, she's learning how to toast, you know, butter a piece of toast. But really what she's learning is that she's a person in the world who is, you know, kind and helpful and not just a lump to be taken to school. So for me, this has been this amazing let grow <laughs> experiment that you're seeing, you know, in your own kid. Where it turns out that she loves to draw. It turns out that she has, she's perfectly capable of keeping herself entertained for hours at a time. And, and, you know, nobody's entertained by something that's boring. So, so it is flow. She's trying to get better at it. She's interested. And that is a transferable skill, the patience, the frustration tolerance, um, the activity of doing something over and over again, practice. These are all skills that you need in school and in life. And so the fact that she's not doing her, her math homework, maybe now, but she's drawing, that's still a very good thing for her, even academically well i'm i want to i'm so fascinated in some of the general bad habits of parenting that covid may have been um changing mm -hmm. but just before we get there tell me about did this have a, different effects on different age groups because i know oh, my daughter yeah, young kids it's 18, hard yeah. you know it was her senior year when this hit and she she was very stoic about it and she's a good like she's a good student, thank God. So she was very diligent about attending her online classes, but that whole loss of social life, especially in the early phases, I think is so critical to that age group. And that, that was a blow. And she did end up doing a lot of great things and doing a lot more in-depth, independent reading and things, but just that loss of social connection with her peers, which is so critical, I, I feel was, was very tough. I don't doubt it. Also, I would think that seniors would be the ones having the hardest time because this was, you know, it's sort of the frenzy of bonding before the next mm -hmm. phase of their lives. And that was cut short. And also the exultation of like, oh, my God, we've made it through, you know, 12 years plus however many of preschool to this jumping off point. I, I think that would be, you know, really, you know, joyous interruptus. That does sound terrible. <laughs> But go back to what you were saying, like, and this has been your life's work. Maybe begin with the anecdote about how you became the worst mom in America and, yeah. and, and, and <laughs> the spiritual development from there that led you to this extraordinary work you now do. Yeah, my life's work. Yeah, I had a life's work before my life's work, which was to be a reporter. Um, and then I became a newspaper columnist. And many years ago, when our son was nine years old, he's 22 now, so it's been a while, he started asking my husband and me if we would take him someplace he'd never been before in New York City, where we live, and let him find his own way home by the subway, because he's one of those kids who loves public transportation, loves the subway. Um, and we're always on the subway. That's how we get around. So one sunny Sunday, I took him to Bloomingdale's and I left him in the handbag department because um, <laughs> really, it always sounds like I, I, I told him that it was the day. It wasn't like he was like, where's my mother? It was no, it was like, okay, today's the day, Izzy. I'm going to leave you here. Goodbye. The handbag department happens to be right where the entrance to the subway is. Bloomingdale sits on top of a subway station. Yep. And so all he had to do, and in fact, what he did do was go downstairs. Um, I gave him a Metro card, which is the way you get on the train. Um, turns out he was on the wrong platform, but he talked to a stranger, which is something that I actually encourage. You can't go off with a stranger, but you can talk to anyone. That's how you get information. Um, and he asked the guy, you know, is this the downtown side? And the guy said, no. And so what did he do? He went up and over, took the train down, took a bus, a very slow bus across town to our uh, apartment 
and um, came through the door, maybe three inches off the ground, maybe six inches off the ground, sort of levitating with this pride of, I think of two things. One is here he, he had entered the adult world, right? So that was great. He'd done it himself. It's the hero's journey. It's what we talk about. But also he knew that we believed in him and that we, had, we, my husband, who's America's worst dad, you never hear about, but, um, That's both, true, isn't it? yeah, <laughs> sexism. It's like, yeah, sex, it's like, you know, dads just exist in the background and, you know, with a pipe still somehow in our minds. So anyways, the point is that I didn't write about it uh, immediately because it didn't strike me as a big deal. But a couple months later, I wrote why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone. And two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR defending myself. And that's how I got the name America's Worst Mom. And I, I really think, you know, had I done this in the suburbs and let him ride his bike, I don't think it would have caused any kind of stir like that. And even if I'd let him ride the subway in, I don't know, uh, Chicago or downtown St. Louis or something. People don't care, but people have a very specific idea, I think, of the New York City subways if you don't live there because it's always in the movies and it's sort of shorthand for hell. <laughs> so it sounded like, mom, let son go to hell. And so, so that was the beginning of this weird life's journey because I started a blog that weekend and I called it Free Range Kids and I said I love safety, helmets, mouth guards, seat belts, extra layers. I'm boiling now, that's why I'm going like this, but I am wearing my extra layer. There it is. <laughs> so um proof. So so I just wanted to say like you can you can love your children and love safety and let them go because until very recently those weren't mutually exclusive. And I just wanted parents to recognize that like um it's not like the crime rate had gone up and therefore we weren't letting kids do things on their own. The crime rate is actually at about a 50 year low now. So it's, I'm angry that we've become so afraid for our kids for really no reason. And that therefore we're taking away their freedom and our own as moms, because we're spending all our time with them, driving them, watching them, helping them. And it's really, um, the, the, the rationale for it, that the kids can't do anything safely or successfully on their own, not only isn't true, I think it's hurting them. So, so Free Range Kids went for 10 years, and then about three years ago, Jonathan Haidt, who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, uh, came to me and said, let's start a nonprofit together. We're, uh, he's worried about kids being um, sort of fragile and uh, anxious uh, by the time they get to college. And he realized that uh, it must be starting sooner than college. You don't suddenly become fragile and anxious because you step on campus. So let's start something where we try to battle um, a society that is making kids, treating kids as if they can't handle anything to the point where they start to believe it. So yeah. together we started Let Grow. That's it. Yeah, no, no, I love it. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about the concept of anti-fragility in children? Because sure. actually, before I let you do that, I just want to quickly intrude with an, a personal anecdote. Okay. Um, actually, it's, it's not my, intruding. Well, I know, it's right? A conversation. So I will continue this. No, my, actually, my, my father, my husband um, is English, and uh, his father uh, was a big believer in making, in, in doing very much the sort of thing you, that you describe. Um, and he had a he had a he had a sort of routine, and they lived all over the world. So this could have been done in any city. He was a in, pilot, correct? He was a pilot, yeah. and they lived in they lived in yeah. Tahiti, they lived in North Africa, they lived yeah. all over the place in in Bahrain. And um, he would, my husband Hugo would sometimes just find that he was being dropped off in a random <laughs> place, uh, usually you know a mile or two from where he was living. <laughs> and his father would say, "Okay, you know, hoodie, as they called him, uh, okay, hoodie, find your way home." And, you know, this was for, I think, one or two of his siblings, um, a pretty daunting and rather alarming experience. But he, my husband, was, he was like, he was sort of contemptuous. He's like, well, obviously I can find my way home. <laughs> and, um, but similarly, when he was 14, his father said, they were living in Japan at the time. His father said, okay, here are some boots. You need to climb Mount Fuji this weekend. Here's a <laughs> to get you up. So he, you know, at 14, put on the boots, got his, you know, went to the train station, spoke to strangers in order to, you know, figure out how to get the ticket. I mean, in Japan then, and at least when I was last there, you know, most signs are not in English. And he got his way up Mount Fuji and got back down again. You right. know? Wow. Well, yeah. that's, that's, that's sort of extreme. Ex, yeah. Extreme, yes, yes, extreme. But, but, you know, but, but clearly it works. Anyway, so, so that's just, that's the plug for, for doing this, um, even, even in, uh, in, in less American circumstances. But anti-fragility, I think that what I see that that did to my husband, uh, yeah. and clearly maybe with your son too, the more 
you let them biff about, the more they develop the capability to biff about. So tell us Are we about using what, the word biff? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I didn't want to comment on that because I thought I didn't use it. Thing. Yeah. It's like a, a 1920s English biff not. word. Biff <laughs> right. about, you know? Right, right. right. Biffing about. Right. 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 Let's have a spot of tea and then we'll biff. Right. <laughs> right. I'm just glad it doesn't have some urban dictionary. No, sort of no well, it may, now. for all no, we know. No, my God. No, no, no biffing on the femme's plane. But anti-fragility, tell us about that. All right. Well, it's not my concept. And, um, and oh, frankly, geez. at some point, I got to read that book. <laughs> oh, boy. Now you know. Okay. There is a, it's a, there's a book by Nassim Taleb, and it's about anti-fragility. And um, the concept, which I have absorbed, even without actually oh, cracking the, the spine of that book, um, is this, that there are some things that literally are fragile if you take well, this is this is not probably that fragile, but if I if I drop this my my coffee cup on the ground, uh, it'll probably break, right? Because it's fragile. Certainly, a wine glass fragile. Uh, then there are things that are not fragile, like let's use this my rubber band here. If I drop this on the ground, which I'm going to do right now, she is ah. demonstrating to those just listening to this. Oh, and sorry, not watching oh, yeah. it on YouTube. <laughs> That's right. Sorry, I dropped a rubber band on the ground. I, actually, a hair twisty thing on the ground, and mm -hmm. it's just fine. Um, so you could say that that's resilient, but it, it hasn't gotten any better, but it hasn't gotten any worse. It's just the same old hair scrunchie that it began as. But then there are some things and systems that are anti-fragile, and that is that they need a bit of stress to actually um, engage and get stronger. And one of those systems is the immune system. Uh, you know, it needs to encounter some germs to build up some antibodies, something that we're thinking about all the time now, so that it can fight off um, whatever is coming at them. And another uh, system that needs a little bit of stress is bones, which mine are skinny and terrible as can be, but if I did my weight strengthening, you know, pushed against them, um, they would get stronger. And the most, I guess the, the system that needs this kind of stress and exposure to a little bit of you know, concern, a little bit of difficulty the most is kids. Because kids come into the world like sort of un, unbaked. Um, I was just actually just talking to a woman named Barbara Sarneka. She's a professor at the University of California, Irvine. And she said that you know, if you watch like a gazelle comes into the world and about four hours after it's born, it can do everything it needs to do as a grown up gazelle, right? It can run, it can avoid hyenas, it can eat, you know, it can speak gazelle, whatever it is, it's got it all because it doesn't need to know much to survive. So it can all come pre-programmed in the brain. You can, there's like a little chip in there and everything it needs to know is there. But us, we come out in the world and, oh, my God, someplace we got to learn Chinese, someplace we have to learn what Biff means, someplace we have to learn <laughs> to climb. We have to learn how to live in, you know, freezing conditions or boiling conditions in the forest or in a skyscraper. We have to learn how to get along with so many different kinds of people. And so we are wired to take information in and we are wired to be curious and we are wired to do things and learn a lot of times from our mistakes. That didn't work. I blew it there. That made somebody mad. That made that meant that I couldn't get what I wanted. I fell, and um, so those are the building blocks of childhood. Are sometimes great things, but sometimes betrayal, confusion, despair, um, disappointment, frustration. And if we have taken all of these out of kids' lives, out of an abundance of concern that it's too much for them to handle, that I, normally somewhere in this house I have my my sons. A trophy that I could show you wherever it is for eighth place out of nine teams at a bowling league, teen bowling league. I think by the time you're a teen and you're winning eighth place, you know that you don't deserve a trophy, but somehow <laughs> the, 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 the team gave them a trophy anyway. Um, so if we keep saying that nothing should hurt them, distress them, confuse them, upset them, then we are making them fragile because it's like Django. We've taken out all sorts of um, building blocks that they need to become this whole successful anti-fragile person. And instead, we're leaving them with this rickety structure of like, don't hurt me and I can't handle it and where's the teacher and I'm going to complain um, that is... It, it does them a disservice, even though I don't blame parents because I feel like all our culture keeps telling us, watch out, your kid is fragile, don't let them get hurt from physical to, to mental. Um, so we've been programmed 
to believe that we should be raising our kids in a way that I actually think is detrimental. Um, I'm so fascinated by what you also speak of at bottom, which is this feeling of competence that we're robbing them of. And I, I think it's funny. We, we've talked a little bit about this in the past on the show, but I mean, this is my generation that is the helicopter parents. And we grew up in the 70s, the most negligent era of parents oh. maybe ever. Um, and, and I say that with great fondness. Because, right, right, right. Pride. You know, right? I feel like, like the things, I mean, I was, forget your son, I was going down to my dentist appointments downtown on the Toronto subway when I was eight years old. And it would have offended me. In fact, I do remember uh, an adult stopping me and saying, are you okay, little girl? Because I was also unusually short for my age. And I was so affronted. <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. And, and, and but it, it is that um, when I used to joke that our, my children would be the least accomplished children in all of Washington, <laughs> D.C., because I refused to put them, I mean, if they wanted to do something, if they wanted to learn an instrument, I would say, okay, but they had to do it. And then if they didn't want to do it anymore, we stopped. But this idea that I was my imposition to make them play the violin, sing opera, be soccer stars, which would all it would result in me nagging them and driving them early on Saturday mornings. And I, writing checks. And writing checks. Yeah. I'm just like, no, I'm not going to do that. And the result was, I mean, they did find... The things that they then did, they truly enjoyed. Or they could, they could say, you know what, I'm really not liking this. And then stopping. And, and just to have that choice and that option, you want to be introduced to things, but you also don't want to be forced into them. And this idea that we've gotten into the habit of setting up the cereal bowl, you know, um, <laughs> Is, is, or, or making sure that you, that you are responsible for putting in their homework in their bag. Or you know, checking their homework. Or, che or, che refuse or checking their... I've always refused mm, to do that. It's so boring. Right, because it's like, it's like I, I, I remember my kids, I mean, you, of course, if they come to you and they need help, you, you sort you of... Just, you tra that's when you traumatize them in, no, in, in our family. No, you, you, you help them, but like you help them understand something. But this idea, like, I, said, I remember saying to my kids once, look, I've done sixth grade math. I don't need to graduate from it again, but you do. And Sounds like you don't actually remember sixth grade math and you're trying to come up with I, Oh, no. And I, the, the dirty secret was I couldn't. But, I mean, their math Sure I did uh, sixth grade math. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so like our sixth grade math, what is it now like first grade math? But anyway, the whole point is um, this idea that we set up everything for them. We protect them. And with the result, and, and we, we had Greg Gutianoff on the show. He was oh. the co-author of um, The, the Cosmic American. American Mind. Um, that that you, you've set up kids who can't actually survive in the real world. So I was very curious to see if COVID, just by the sheer fact of driving their parents into being alcoholics, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> sort of the 70s again, um, <laughs> would sort of the parents like they, they cannot be responsible for their children 24 7 and we just have to detach themselves from doing this um have to put them make them take out the garbage and do things that maybe mm -hmm. they didn't normally do um, yeah um so first of all yes that's that's what we're seeing happening um is that thing you just i mean even if you want to uh fill in all those hours that normally were filled with commuting, school, after school, and commuting home, there's, there's no way you can, especially if you have to like eat or do a job at some point during the day. And so what we loved is one of the questions we asked on this giant survey um, was, what new thing have you started to do just for fun, not for school? And uh, the reason I love it is because the kids were like, they did not repeat the same things. I mean, sure, a lot of kids were baking, and some of the kids were sewing. A lot of kids were sewing masks and stuff. But um, oh my God, here's my little, uh, uh, we wrote up, I just went through and looked for some of the cuter things. They were learning to, kids said that they were learning to roller skate, clean the toilet, code, sew, <laughs> saw, all at the same time. make sandwiches. This, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these are all different kids, every, every kid different. Um, and then they were finding out, you know how, you know how kids love, um, like the Ripley's Believe It or Not 
books. Oh, yeah, Do you remember yeah, how much love, love fun yeah, those, those were? Huge, yeah. yeah. Yes. And there's something about an age, I would say like from eight to 11, that those are the most important facts you could possibly know <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and so book of world the records. longest nails. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm seeing the guy. It was a man in China, <laughs> was it not? Chinese, yeah. I think, right? With yes. Chinese, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I saw a woman like that the other day. But um, <laughs> anyways, so they were finding, like here's something. Because we can't get manicures, Lenore. <laughs> oh, okay. We all, yeah, we all have the longest enough. nails in the world. Right. I certainly have the longest hair that I've had in years. Okay. Uh, like turtles, can, so they wrote things like, what have you learned in last week? Uh, turtles can live 150 years. Food takes seven seconds to go through the stomach. I don't even know if that's true. Um, well, <laughs> you a seven-year-old. <laughs> right. Uh, you should never give someone who is internally bleeding any fluids. That was one of my favorite kids. Wow, it's like, so good these are, this is yeah. news we can use. <laughs> well, is it news? I mean, if they're internally bleeding, how do you know? Well, yeah. <laughs> right? no. Aren't we all internally bleeding? <laughs> that's a sort of a philosophical question. Um, <laughs> let's see. So they were using microscopes, building forts, studying fuses, um, a kid was taking pictures of bugs. Wait, I got to tell you, one of my other favorite kids, where was he? He was, oh, yes, yeah, I am uh, watching videos and reading articles about Old West trappers. I am also watching videos about 1940s gangsters and researching them. I mean, I can tell you that was not on the curriculum for, you know, fifth grade at this kid's school. But somehow he stumbled onto it, I'm sure, on YouTube. And, you know, nobody... The, the reason I keep thinking of like kids are seeds and that they need this free time to, to sort of grow is like nobody in would have ever gone through like, okay, honey, we're going to give you a list of a hundred topics and you tell me which one. And they would have finally gotten to number 98. How about 1940s gangsters? Yes, mom. Yes. I want to learn that. Your mother wouldn't have known to, to show you that. So you just need this free time to see what turns you on. And there were so many kids who like, hadn't even ridden a bike before. Right. And, like, they we're all right, over the right. neighborhood, I notice now. Yes, and, yes. Yeah, people were out throwing balls back yeah, and forth yeah. with their dads. No, yeah. It was yeah. Great. yeah, it's like, yeah. what's that spherical thing coming at me, dad? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Let me, let's stop for just a second because I want to remind our listeners of how important their contributions are to keeping the Femsplainers going. Enjoying the program. You might be enjoying it more if you knew you could join the conversation as well. Consider becoming a subscriber at Patreon. And not only will you support your favorite podcast, and we depend on your support, but you'll receive our special monthly bonus episode, Last Call, in which you get to ask our guest questions. It's a completely fresh, exclusive podcast available only to our patrons. Contribute $10 a month or more, and you can listen to the podcast ad-free. And all subscribers receive our monthly newsletter. So go now to patreon.com slash femsplain and join with whatever you can give. Buy us the equivalent of a monthly coffee or a monthly cocktail. Everything helps. We can't do this without you. Um, I, uh, I was introduced to a wonderful concept, which perhaps you two are familiar with. Uh, I just learned this last night. Um, do you know the concept of type 2 fun? No. Isn't it? Okay. It's great. Is it like I diabetes? Think it's something that's kind of an ordeal at the time, but it turns uh -huh. into a great memory. So, and if you think about- Oh, wow. Right? I'm writing that down. Isn't yes. That's good? really cool. It's, right. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, think I, I once actually on a reporting trip had to go to Somalia. It was very, very <laughs> tough. This was in 1993. <laughs> I hated every minute of it. And it is, I now think back on it. It was the, some of the warmest. I mean, really, that was type two fun. Yeah. I, I have a friend who once, <laughs> who once drove in a, in a, in a, well, well, never mind. An anecdote for another time. <laughs> it's just going too far. But so, okay, so here we have, we, we now have this rosy assessment. COVID has had this, these sunny uplands of children discovering themselves, um, which I really hope is, you know, is, is, is true and sustained. But what happens if we, <laughs> you know, the thing we so ardently desire, which is a return to the status quo ante, or so we think, mm -hmm. what happens then? Do you, see, do you see childhood reshaping? Do you see parenting reshaping? Uh, if we're able to mm -hmm. start, you know, resuming regular school. Do you think we're all going to buy back into it? You know, I don't know. And I've also always been very terrible at trends. I thought the tattoos were like a blip. Um, so, <laughs> so I wouldn't well, totally trust me. Ge geologically but... speaking, they really are. <laughs> okay. That's, that's good to hear. Um, what I do know is that, so before the pandemic hit, um, 
and, and currently, one of the things that Let Grow promotes, and it's a free program that, that we suggest that schools do, is called the Let Grow Project, where kids go with the home with the homework assignment. Mom, I have to do something on my own without my parents. You know, you oh walk the, I imagine right. you have to tell them to do that. Uh, I do imagine, and that's exactly what we wow. do. And it, wow. it is, it's great. It is, and we have a list of things. You can walk the dog, you can ride your bike, you can make muffins, whatever. What's, what has been amazing about it is the amazingly deep transformation it has in both the parents and the kids. Because so many kids have been allowed to do almost nothing that you would have done at their age. Um, you know, forget being an eight-year-old on the subway, being an eight-year-old and allowed down the block and to go around the corner. I once asked a, a group of fifth graders, which are 11, 10 and 11 years old, um, how many of you have ridden your bike on the block? And everybody raised their hand. I said, how many of you were allowed to go around the corner? And most of the hands came down. So this is just a, an era that I don't think a lot of adults who, who don't have young kids now recognize how incredibly curtailed what children are allowed to do has been. Um, one third grader I was interviewing once and I asked him, what would you like to do on your own? And he said he wanted to get to karate by himself. And I said, okay, how? And I was expecting, you know, probably not the subway, but probably, you know, walking or riding his bike or maybe a skateboard. And he said, no, uh, well, let's see, I'll, I'll get out of the car. And then I close the door and then my mom parks the car in the parking lot while I go in by myself. Wow. Oh, poor right. little guy. <laughs> well, poor little guy, poor little era, poor little oh, mom stuck poor driving little. him there and running in so that, you know, he's worrying, not, right? Worrying. worrying. And, and maybe even they're required to be there. I mean, that's why I never blame parents. If all the other parents are there or if yeah. for liability yeah. reasons, you have to watch every second or it's a 37 and a half minute class. And so to, to drop him off and try to get anything else done doesn't work. And nobody's going to let him walk to there because it's either too far or too scary or too much. So um, when we have done these projects where the kid goes and does something on their own, it, it releases the mom or the dad to say, Oh, I guess I'll let you go because it's an assignment, right? So it's not like they're being this crazy free range parent. They're letting them go because the school, the teacher whom they trust said the kid had to do this and the kid has to do it because all the other kids in the class are doing it. So we are renormalizing this idea that kids can do things on their own, even with each other and that parents can let go and wait at home and, and have that happen. And we've heard so many amazing stories about parents like, like one kid went and got a mohawk. All right, that was a bad example. But, um, <laughs> well, it's but, it grows back. It, it grows is, back. Uh, yeah, right. It must have grown back now because that was like two years ago. But um, <laughs> but the point is that the mom said, you know, at first she was really angry and then she realized like, okay, he is a person. He's allowed, you know, he's figuring yeah, out right. who he is, what he wants to do, drive me a little crazy. But then she said, okay, you can get a mohawk. You can do your homework. And he started doing his homework on his own too. So if this is the, um, the outcome of kids doing just a project a week or a project a month, and now we've had six months of COVID, I cannot imagine kids who have gotten used to the extremely delightful freedom of riding your bike and going where you want to go, wandering the woods and not having to run back because it's soccer time. Uh, who's going to give that up? I mean, even if they want to go back to some of the things that they were doing before, they will have found other interests and their parents are going to be seeing them through, through, you know, the scales have fallen from their eyes and, you know, you don't need every second filled. And now you spend a lot of time, you know, drawing. Like, right. you know, or if, if flow is happening, you know, with them doing, you know, whatever they're doing, you know, Tai Chi or, or, or baking cookies or whatever, I think parents are going to say, why should I spend another $300 on yet another after school program when Thursdays and Fridays, I'm just going to give them free. Right. Well, I, I think an important thing to stress too, is this false notion of, of, safety or lack of safety in the modern world. And you were telling that anecdote about letting your son go on the New York subway at nine versus riding his bike in the suburbs. In the suburbs, he was way more likely to get hit by a car. And, and the, the biggest danger to children today is not being abducted randomly by a stranger. That's infantismal. It's been hit by a car. Now, maybe that's gone it's down. It's actually being a passenger COVID. in a car. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that right? Number one but, is, yeah, being right. yeah, number one. Right. right. But, but if you're going to let your kid go out in the street, getting picked up by a stranger is not the thing to worry about. And I remember when our kids were little, uh, two of them ended up going to the public school that is literally two blocks from our house. Okay. Literally two blocks from our house. And you can go to it via side streets. You don't have to cross any busy road. And so, they, and they like your son. They were 
desperate once yeah. they got to like fifth, sixth grade, desperate to do it on their own. So I, I tested them. I said, okay, you go ahead. I'm going to follow you. And you, I have to see that you look both ways when you cross the street, you know, and they had these rules. And I said, if you pass the test, then you can do it. So they, you know, they, they love this. So they right. have their little exam. And they pass. And I said, you know, I, I, you didn't look left when you crossed that street. You only look right. And they go, okay, okay, I'll, 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 think, I'll, I'll do that next time. And then they started walking to school. I mean, they had cell phones, for God's sake. <laughs> and we didn't have cell phones. And, and I got such scandal at oh, the school yeah. that neighbors really, saw. But what was great is the teachers were on my side. So I'd, I signed a form saying, you can just send them home after school. And sometimes they'd stay and play in the playground. My son, the first few days was like your son when he was doing this, he came home whistling. I mean, just as so, but so proud of themselves. And so suddenly out from under that parental thumb and just having that two block freedom to pause, to pick up a stick, to, to be human, to be, be human, human, to not be a Ming vase that's taken someplace right. and gently put down and then watched so that nobody hurts it and then picked up and put back in the car. There, there, there's somebody, this was not my revelation, which is too bad because it's so cool. But in the <laughs> olden days, um, when we walked to school, there was a bell and it was a rival, right? You got there, there was a rival yeah. bell. And then at the end of the day, it was, it was called dismissal, right? Right. And nowadays it is drop off and pick up because the, the word has been baked into the language that of course somebody is with you dropping you off and picking you up. The idea that you, I mean, that's why I don't blame parents. I mean, yeah. I walked my kids to school yeah. too. Why was I doing this? I just, everybody else is doing it. I guess I'll do it too. So you stand there at drop off. I mean, it even, it's a, it's a noun, right? right. You're at drop off and nobody was dropping you off in the old days because you had feet and you were allowed to use them. Yep. And now you're treated like a, a, like a FedEx package. You know, I got to drop it off at nine and, and then I got to pick tracking. it up. And right. you got to get a signature too. Right, yeah. right, right. Well, that's funny. I mean, you mentioned that you said you had to sign a form that says, yeah, you know, you okay, go. I'm going to take, and it, by the time you're signing a waiver, it sounds like, you know, generally you sign a waiver before you do hang gliding, you know, <laughs> 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 but, but you're signing it to say that my fifth grader who is 11 years old can yeah. walk two blocks home what an insult to the human species that we've started <laughs> no really i mean it's I like yeah yeah and so and it's, you get dark looks about it and go whoa that 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 yeah, pressure that from lady was, who, oh, yeah. that's that's why that's why i have to put in a plug again for the let grow project it's it is the social norm of your school to give you, you know, the, what is it, the cross eye, or there's another word for it. But anyways, the, the bug eye, whatever it is, to look at you, uh, you know, with suspicion and derision. And evil eye, fish eye. Evil eye, eye evil eye. Yeah, fish yeah. eye. <laughs> it's the fish eye from fish the hotel eye. clerk, like in a place in the development called. That's what I'm looking for. You, you can oh. sniff this out. The fish eye. Anyways, the point being that we have to change the norms because the norms are off the rails it, it to say that a fifth grader can't walk two blocks two suburban blocks with no big streets to cross is something that any other generation would go huh yeah <laughs> what are you talking yeah. about i mean actually one mom once told me that her kindergarten her daughter's kindergarten teacher said i'm recommending your daughter for the uh talented and gifted program at our school and the mom said oh that's nice why and she said well I got to tell you, her scissors skills are extraordinary. <laughs> and the mom sort of, you know, laughed a little. She said, well, I, I can't say I'm that surprised. Uh, I adopted her at age three from an orphanage in Haiti where she had been peeling mangoes with a machete. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, I'm not saying that that's what Let Grow says everyone should do. I see a new logo for your office. <laughs> that's right. Sign up and get your free machete. Um, <laughs> All I'm saying is that we've really completely lost sight of how competent kids can be, how anti-fragile they are, how many experiences, good and bad, not all bad, but good and bad that they need before they will become fully woven, fully jangled, um, you know, anti-fragile kids who are like, yeah, I can handle that. Mount Fuji, no problem. I, I, Mount Fuji is also sort of with the machete side of yeah, the grow. I hope it's like when he doesn't <laughs> right, right, right. Doesn't have. I think it's a samurai if you're in. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Sure. The point being that you don't have to even do those things. But I, I, I actually 
printed out some things that a seventh grade teacher um, gave me. She asked the kids in, in her class because she'd noticed they were so extraordinarily anxious and she had never dealt with this level of anxiety to the point where she told me like one kid when the kid was late for class after like during lunchtime, she said, well, just go to the cafeteria and get your lunch. Well, you know, you can come back. We'll, we'll wait for you. And the kid said, go to the cafeteria by myself. <gasps> and this was not a gang ridden school. This was a, a suburban school on Long Island. So she had kids. She asked them a question on, on, a, on a worksheet, I guess, that said, um, what is something that you'd like to do that you feel like you're ready to do, but you're still a little hesitant to try? And I will read you some different kids answers. Um, I was hesitant to try walking my dog alone because I was scared that he would get loose from the leash or a scary man would take me. Another kid. I was afraid to climb a tree because I was scared I was going to fall and break a bone. Another kid. I was trying to do a wheelie. I wanted to do a wheelie on my bike, but I was scared I might hurt myself. I was, try I was afraid to try and cook because there's an open flame and I could get hurt. And then the one that I think is possibly most shocking, which was I was hesitant to use a sharp knife as my parents had never let me before. So um, seventh, seventh grade. grade, seventh grade is 12 and 13 years old. Oh, it's criminal. It is. It is. It is. And, and um, the teacher was, this is a teacher who then made the kids do the Lecro project 20 times during the year. And some of the things were, I thought were lame. Um, like I did the laundry or I, um, I don't know, I baked a cookie or whatever. It just didn't strike me as anything that would be growing that you could grow from. But in fact, the cumulative effect of doing those things and riding the bike and going to get a slice of pizza and running an errand all together were so important for these kids. And I, I feel like I can push the Let Grow project because it's free. <laughs> so it's not like I'm pushing something, but like for only $29.99 and, you know, uh, <laughs> well, payments oh, that's for the rest of <laughs> well, <laughs> before, the be, before you go, just um, can, is this something... Even as a parent, yeah, I could download and yeah. just do it on my own with my kids. Yes, yes, because once COVID hit, we thought, oh my gosh, what can we do that allows parents to both give their kids one of these projects? And also, the, the great thing it does, it also helps the parent realize that this is growth. This is your kid getting smarter, wiser, anti-fragile. It's not just like, oh, they took a bike ride. It's like a bike ride is a, is a developmental milestone that you can exalt in. So if you go to Let Grow, L-E-T-G-R-O-W, not let it grow, letgrow.org, um, if you can look up the independence kit, the Let Grow independence kit, that's the one for parents at home. Right. The Let yeah. Grow project is for schools. But I wanted to tell you one story that the seventh grade teacher told us later. And, you know, if I'd been more organized, I would have shown you this on my phone. Um, All right. It's, it's audio. So don't worry. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. So I'll tell you what it is. She said, so one of the kids um, texted her to say that thanks to her, she's an inspiring teacher, you know, always saying, get out of your comfort zone and doing the Let Grow project. He's now off his anxiety meds. Wow. wow. That's incredible. And, and also as a parent, what is good about that program is often parents are confronted, especially when they're tired, the kids going, well, I'm bored, but I don't know what to do. I don't, and this is, I assume that there are prompts that you can like that, just the whole idea, yeah. what is something you've always been nervous about doing and wanting to do? So it's also opens that conversation between parents and kids too about how to, that's fascinating. Well, right. well, Lenore, thank you. Thank you so yeah, much so great. for joining oh, us. thank you guys. You I know. hope we've inspired some of you at home to... Should we have a really quick argument at the end so that we can stir up oh, some animals? Oh, we animal. haven't. Yeah, oh, we right. have right. yeah, right. yeah. Keep kids down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a anyway, great idea. Well, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, listeners, stay with us. We have a small amount of listener reaction afterwards. But um, again, thanks, Lenore. Oh, thank you, ladies. Bye, Lenore. Bye-bye. Wow, I think the thing I hope our listeners at minimum take away from Lenore is that she gives it's permission for you to be this way as a parent, which I think parents actually need. It's funny because it's terrifying to tr seemingly be a bad parent or a oh, neglectful yeah. parent yeah, well, we all, by modern standards, you know? Right. I think as parents, we all actually need models. We do need role models. We follow role models. And I think one of the reasons we have this weird oppressive sort of w way of child rearing now is that 
we've been following the wrong people, you know? Or it's just peer, either we're following our peers. Well, yeah, right. But our peers are misinformed and have bad ideas. <laughs> and well, we you try to be our... that lady in the soccer lineup. Yeah, who, well, I, you mean, know. I actually, I mean, I do have, I have my own anecdotes of trying to stand out against the crowd. And it's terrifying because if your child is the one walking to the store to get bread and your child yeah. is the only child, yeah. you know, your child looks like a, a potential victim and other adults like look askance at you. So yeah, you take, it takes bravery. I know. I think it's fantastic what she's doing also because she's, she is modeling through her own actions and through all the, you know, the kind of teaching that she's promulgating. She's modeling a way of parenting that is, you know, fantastically uh, nourishing for kids and, and releasing for parents. You know, after yes. all, our job is to raise them, not to coddle right. them. This is, this is parents licensed to go pour yourself a cocktail <laughs> And let your kid just, just light a cigarette. Light a cigarette <laughs> and just figure it out. Let yeah, that kid let just that kid figure, it, figure out. it out. All right. Well, we have a couple of um, listener reactions. And I just want to encourage everyone. Yeah, we love hearing from you. And um, you can go to femsplainers.com and find all the links to our social accounts if you want to reach out that way. You can also just write us at contact at femsplainers.com and we'll get those. And, and we love hearing from you. So we have two two reactions and i'm going to let you you read the second one megan because okay. that's a little longer and it's it's pretty funny this is from our episode last week with barry weiss and caitlin flanagan and i have a note from uh dane initial last initial c he was reacting to the fact that barry was saying sort of post new york times there were no neutral centrist grounds anymore in the mainstream media that that every publication seems to have an agenda and, or, and cable station and everything. Um, so Dane says, thank you, great conversation. I'm so hungry to hear this type of sane discussion. Funny, I am exactly the person Barry described. Following select people on Twitter, listening to the right podcasts, subscribing to the newsletters. But most of the well-meaning and easily misled people are, are not, do not, sorry, are not, in the need of the type of media company Barry described. She was saying that unless you become a very shrewd consumer of media, it's going to be very hard to figure out what was going on. And yeah, it's true, point. but that's, yeah. um, so that's why you have to listen to the Femsplain. Well, can I just say? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> good right, good Anna, for you. And, and I, w I would like <laughs> to read um, a contribution from Lana um, with, uh, with which I have to say, I heartily um, agree. Uh, she says, Lay off poor Melania, please. Barry is right. She didn't sign up to be first lady. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Because yeah. I, I did trash the first lady See, of this I episode. Just think this is, okay, I'm glad I'm brought onto this podcast to be a corrective <laughs> to Danielle and, her and Lana. Vitriol. All right, go yeah, on. Okay. Go on, Lana. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lana, as Lana and Megan are both speaking to you now. Um, okay, so she didn't sign up to be first lady. Being first lady is rough enough when marriage means life partnership, but Melania's rich man marries gorgeous woman union is contractual at its core. His job is to provide her with a life of ease and luxury. Her job is to put up with him, raise his kids, host socially impressive dinners, and look glorious all the time. Well, that's enough of a job without having to also charm an entire nation and do whatever good things we expect of a first lady these days. Personally, I'd be a little ticked off if my husband decided to run for president. <laughs> First lady is an unpaid position dating back to when the role of a woman was solely to flutter around her husband's flame. A woman has to give up her own life and career and focus solely on White House duties for the tenure of her husband, up to eight years. That's not remotely feminist. If Melania doesn't want to do the job, kudos to her. In fact, I would commend her for redefining the role instead of escalating it. Somehow we've gone from the first lady hosting dinners to the first lady starting national movements. It almost seems like every first lady has to outdo the previous. Can we call it competitive first ladying? <laughs> Sometimes the strong thing is to stand up and say, enough, I won't participate in this. Melania has every right to do so, and I, for one, will not miss a chance to stand up for that right. You go, Lana. Tiny violins. Oh, no. <laughs> And everybody's human. Everybody's fragile. Everyone, you know, we're all trying to make our way. So, you, so, 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 well, okay. I guess, I guess, to her point, you may disagree. Um, 
we don't have the British model or the actually the Canadian model and, and most democratic models around the world. We are, have an actual model. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, in, in, around the world, that the first spouse, and with Margaret Thatcher, it was Dennis Thatcher. They do not, I mean, in some ways, honestly, it's a bit worse position because they have no role at all. But yet, because of the nature of their spouse's position, they, they also, you can't work anyway because of conflict of interest. Like, the role was developed, A, as Lana says, because wives were traditionally not you know, elected president or had these duties. But, but, but you're just in this huge otherwise political cauldron. And you, so, so you either do absolutely nothing, and Dennis Thatcher had to give up his business. He had to retire. Or you, yeah. The Canadians don't want you to do anything but the most ceremonial things right. and hosting dinners. Right. So I, I think I would kind of blow my brains out in that. But so the First Lady now has developed into this great opportunity to give something to your country to be patrons of great causes. Um, and my argument was that Melania made it very clear that not she was a great feminist role model, but she, she has so little interest in doing anything for anybody else. It was reflected in her tenure as a first lady. I don't know. I think that's reading a lot into somebody else. I mean, you're, you're, you're imposing a script on her, on her. I mean, I'm, look, I'm, I'm not, you know, Anything I'm saying should not be interpreted as, you know, gushing adulation for the Trump family or anything on any of its works. But I do think that a woman, you know, a woman marries a man. She finds herself uh, put into this, you know, a a very beautiful woman. The world is looking at her. As she said, it was contractual and... There's a word for that too. Okay, come on. Every marriage, every marriage is contractual, as well as being a sacrament, etc. But you know, every marriage has its arrangement, and we, you know, and you want to keep. You'll give me the diamonds, and I. No, no. So let's. Maybe this is an invidious comparison, but let let us think about uh, in in the British uh, um, royal system. Who do we really admire? Who gives the public what the public wants? It is Kate Middleton, and why is that? Because she looks lovely all the time and she is a woman who acts with dignity. Now, I don't think, unless I'm mistaken, that Melania has really committed any crimes greater than that. She looks, as Lana says, glorious all the time and she, and she, just, she is decorative and, uh, and behaves with dignity. I mean, I think that that should be a, 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 you know, an appreciated quality in a that's, first you know, that's, that's That's fair. That's fair. But you know what? I don't really care. Do you? <laughs> I, do I not, don't really care. Do you? I'm trying to get that accent. I, right. yeah, no, I don't. I don't really care either. I, I don't. I do appreciate people who, who turn themselves out and look good because, you know, I who doesn't like to look at well? That's female true. She does. She does. She does dress beautifully, yeah. and um, I, I'll be interested if we ever do have a first dude. What will? What he will do? Um, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway um all right well thank you again uh don't hesitate to reach out to us and thank you megan for co-splaining it was my absolute delight and i can't wait to come back all right we'll see you next week the femsplainers is a weekly podcast carried on the ricochet network and available pretty much on every podcast platform follow us on twitter instagram and facebook And watch video of our interviews on YouTube. You'll find links to everything, plus how to contact us directly at femsplainers.com. We survive and depend on your support. Like the show? Consider donating as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash femsplainers. And get our exclusive monthly bonus episode, Last Call, in which you get to join the conversation with our guests. And there's much more. And a big shout out of thanks to our audio and video editor, Nat Frum.